This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Boz Digital Labs, and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. Um, so usually what I do is I find things that like I'm doing that are far more work than they need to be. Uh, and I see if I can, if I can, you know, bring that into a single plugin. You know, sometimes a plugin format is a really good way to fix the problem. Sometimes it's not. But if I can bring it into a plugin and make, make it easier to do something, to get a good sound in the end, then, then I make it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Boz Digital Labs, offering you the coolest plugins for your mixes, like the Hoser XT and Plus 10 dB Signature Series. You can transform your drums with Sasquatch Kick Machine or Transgressor, get massive bass with Big Clipper, or add width and depth using Mongoose and Imperial Delay. All Boz Digital Labs plugins are available as fully functioning, no time limit free trials, so you can check them out on your mixes right now. Just go to bozdigitallabs.com or click the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with the unique Golden Drop capsule design. The Black Hole Series BH-1S and BH-2 microphones with the hole in the middle for a -a one-of-a-kind shock mount combine innovative industrial design with careful craftsmanship to bring a world-class sound to your studio, resulting in a level of quality and detail in your recordings that you won't find in other mics. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR right now to get an incredible 50% off. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Boz Millar, a great, though he might not admit it, multi-instrumentalist musician and creator of Boz Digital Labs plugins. Boz creates professional audio plugins with one goal in mind, and that's to make solutions for your mixing problems. Creative solutions, in fact, because his plugins are unusual and unique and really awesome. So I'm going to read a little quote from the Boz Digital Labs bio, too, that Boz is located in Olympia, Washington, where we are dedicated to researching new and innovative algorithms and solutions to make music production both easier and more inspiring. Whether simple or complex, we strive to find the best solution to the problems that every audio engineer runs into. And that means you, rock stars. We are not content with rewriting all the same tools that we have had for the past 50 years. They're great tools to have, but as computers become more powerful, we have the opportunity to explore areas and ideas that were not practical or even possible even just a few years ago. We are extremely excited for the future of music production and the role that audio plugins and future formats hold. So, Rockstars, I discovered Boz Digital Labs years ago when I bought plugins like T-Bone, Imperial Delay, and one of my favorites, which is Sasquatch Kick Machine, and began using them on all my mixes. Then, more recently, I got to meet Boz Millar in person at Winter NAM last year and learn more about all this complete line of super cool plugins he's been creating. And today, I'm super psyched to have Boz joining us on the show to talk all about designing and creating the tools that we can use to make our records and to dig into how we can use each of his existing plugins to create really awesome sounds and mixes. So please welcome Boz Millar to Recording Studio Rockstars. Boz, are you ready to rock, dude? 
I am ready. <clears throat> Such a pleasure to have you here. You know, I, I'm not sure what the analogy is, but when I had Matt Boudreau from Working Class Audio on the podcast here years ago, I, I described him as my brother from another podcast. And I kind of feel like kindred spirit with you, like you're, you're my brother from a plug-in company. <laughs> Sweet. So it's really a pleasure to have you here, man. I, I, I like your style a lot. And we were joking around before the interview a little bit about uh, your good sense of humor and some of the stuff that you've got up on YouTube and elsewhere. Um, there was a really funny um, video that you put out about the 432 Hertz plugin once upon a time. So maybe we'll come back to that at some point. But that sorry, was my best work. I, I digress a little bit. Give us an introduction in your own words to who you are and and what you do, man. What's your what's what what are you all about, dude? Oh, geez. Um, I well, I have been recording since high school. I think I started recording because. I, you know, I took piano lessons as a kid and hated every second of it. Um, tried to learn the guitar, sucked at that. Figured I'd try to learn the drums because I wouldn't have to read music. Um, and I just learned after every instrument I tried to learn, I just learned that I wasn't that good. <laughs> but it was so much fun to do. And recording was sort of like this. It was like, it let me cheat. It let me make a song without actually being good at any of the instruments I played. That's a good point. <laughs> so like, I mean, back then I would record like a measure without screwing up and it would take me months to finish a song, but like I could get a song done and I could say, look, I'm pl I played the guitar. I played the drums. I played the bass on all of these. And it was, it was sort of an addiction that like to, to be able to do that, to know that I, absolutely sucked at this thing and was able to actually finish a song and sort of the process of that taught me how to play some instruments as well so yeah i feel like that's one of the things that you benefit from when you create a studio like once i decided i was going to have a studio then i started to collect instruments that i didn't play before like a drum set or a piano or you know a bass and uh, cuz i kind of started with guitar and it's super fun. Then you start, then you're like, oh, I'm going to try and learn how to play that. Right. Yeah, exactly. And actually for me, it's a lot of using like virtual instruments. Like if I'm going to, I love doing like orchestration stuff. And so it made me like, oh, now I need to buy a cello and a violin and a viola. Nice. So you have a cello, violin and viola too? Yes. Man, when do we get to see you play those? Uh, it's not that good to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned enough to be able to learn, you know, like what each instrument can and can't do. Um, but it's not that exciting to watch me play it. Um, have, you, listen to it. have you had fun in the studio, like building a string section on your own? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, it's just I mean, to me, that's the experimentation is the part of recording that is fun. That's yeah. the part I like doing. I I play violin. Um, or should I say fiddle? And mm. um, at the moment, it's not in such good shapes. The bow bugs got to my bow again, and now it just looks like a bomb exploded in my in my <laughs> fiddle case. But uh, it, you fiddle players will know what I'm talking about. Um, but on occasion, I have decided to um, you know build out a string section just for fun, and it's pretty it's pretty cool and it's pretty fun. And and the funny thing is. I mean, if you're really good at it, it's going to sound even better. But if you're not a, if you're not the greatest violinist like me, it's pretty cool to hear how it can start to sound like a great idea as I layer more and more of them all together. You know, right? Yeah, and I find it, playing a lot of instruments is helpful because each instrument I play, I sort of take from a different approach. Like I'm not a good violin player, but if I pick up a violin, I sort of have a few habits and things that I do. So I would come up with different stuff than I would if I was playing it on a keyboard or something. Right. Totally. So just it, to me, it's, it's not about being able to play a lot of instruments. It's, it's different angles to get ideas for making songs. Dude, it's always about having fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but what about, uh, you know, you, you started out with music, you got interest in the studio aspect of it. Fast forward to now, how in the world did you become a plug-in designer and create all these awesome tools for us to use in our studios? 
Uh, so I, when I was in college, I went, I did uh, electrical engineering. Um, it was just sort of, I mean, my dad was an engineer. My older brother did it. My younger brother was doing it. So it was just sort of like, that's what you do, what he had did when you went to college. Um, and while I was there, I, I like, I loved recording. That's what I like doing. But there was sort of this, if I go into recording, I have no idea if I'll ever actually get to have a job. But if I go into engineering, I, sh from what I'm told, I should be able to get a job. So I was like, I don't know what it's like to live in the real world. I'll just go get a, a degree that actually lets me have a job because that's all I know. Um, yeah. And so I got out of school. I worked for Dolby uh, in San Francisco for a couple of years. And, it, and while I was going through school, I was like, my dream job would be making plugins. I don't know why. I've always been obsessed with plugins. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I worked at Dolby for a couple of years and I went and worked for a company that made surveillance cameras. Uh, and they needed, they just, I was in the research department, meaning they were just like trying to come up with all sorts of ideas of stuff that you can do. Um, there was a bunch of, you know, video processing guys that would do like face recognition and crowd taking out algorithms and stuff. And they wanted to see what could be done with audio. So I was like, sweet, I would, that sounds like an awesome job. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to go try it. Yeah. Um, and so I was kind of lucky in that they gave me sort of a, a wide open field to go show us what can be done. And so I just, I learned how to program, you know, audio DSP. I learned how to try different stuff. Um, and it was just fun. And I, and part of it was like, okay, so if I'm going to be, I, I need to be able to show off these algorithms in, you know, real time. And everybody else was using MATLAB for their DSP stuff. And I found it clunky and it's hard to actually show. It's good for prototyping, but it's not good for like showing demos. Well, so, so um, MATLAB in the world of plugin creation is like Pro Tools is for making music or something like that. It's one, yeah, of, it's one of the software of, tools you use. Yeah, it's a software tool that, that a lot of like DSP guys use to, cause it has a, like libraries full of algorithms. You could just plug in and, you know, try stuff. Um, but I found that I just didn't like using it for audio because I liked, it, it was slow and clunky to use. Like you have to send it files and then, see, I mean, you can do it real time, but it's a pain. It's like, like mixing music by committee. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's exactly like that. While it's powerful, it's just really slow to use. So I decided like, I, one, I want to learn how to make plugins. So I'm going to use the VST format for my prototypes as sort of prototypes to show what can be done with video surveillance. So like I made a plugin that listened for gunshots and then turned a camera to look at where it was coming from. Oh, wow. <laughs> it just, it's weird stuff. Um, I, I made plugins that would like have, you know, an array of microphones so that you can like aim you know, beam form and use like pick out people from a crowd that are talking. Wow, that's some um, deep stuff, man. That's some Yeah, it's it was fun. Um, but that eventually uh for larger reasons sort of dried up. Um mm -hmm. as you know, I got there and the team of re of DSP guys was like ten people, you know, me of one in audio, which was me, and then ten guys doing video. And they were just getting laid off. Like every month, a new guy getting laid off. And it got down to like two of us. <laughs> so finally, I was like, okay, I better uh, go find something else to do because this isn't going to last forever. Wow. So I said, fine, I know how to write plugins now. I'm just going to dive in and do it. I thought I was, you know, 10 years late to the game, but. That's so awesome, out. man. I love that you just jumped right in. Um, I, I know that stuff can feel real risky at the time. Um, were you already a family man at that point or was this, you know? Yes. In fact, I had just bought my first house and was about to have another kid. Wow. So those are big decisions. Uh, you know, one of the things I love hearing about this, your story too, is, is I think that in the world of audio, sometimes you can feel, you know, as a music maker, so separated from the source of these incredible tools you use, like the plugin that you're mixing with, you just forget that 
the person on the other end of making this plugin is like you and I trying to make a record in a studio, you know? Oh, right. And I think, I think that's, that's a huge issue with the music industry in general. Um, there's so much like, there's this, like, it's almost feels like it's a club. Mm. And, and, you know, back in the seventies, eighties, nineties, like, the music industry thrived on that idea that that these musicians were not real people. They're inaccessible. You can't talk to them. Mm-hmm. Right. But that's sort of all been broken down, um, which to me is kind of nice because because it seems so fake. Right. Yeah. No, I, I like the the new world of music uh, where you know, social media and things like that open you up to get uh-huh. to know people, you know, I mean, it's the beauty of being able to do a podcast is, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to bring the world together. And, uh, one of the things I enjoy about it too, is when I interview different people and then you hear other names come up and you begin to like stitch together this, uh-huh. this network of people and you're and like, everybody's connected. So anyway, we, di- I digress a little bit, but I, I just appreciate <laughs> you, you know, telling us the backstories. So you start, you started Boz Digital Labs. What was the first plugin that you decided to make? Uh, the first one I released was Bark of Dog. Nice. A classic. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was funny because cause that was back in the day where I still felt like the music industry was a big club. And then I, I, I thought my job was to come out swinging bats. Nice. Um, <laughs> and you kind of did, man. I, one of the I, videos I saw on your channel was... None other than Jack Joseph Puig, who was showing off Bark of Dog at, at a Mix with the Masters event. Right. Um, and it was funny, cause, but I, I've sort of toned down my, my fighting against the machine-ness um, in, my, in my plug-in making. Mostly because now that, you know, I've been to NAMM a few times and like now I know all these guys that, make, that, are, my, that are my, I guess I'll call them competitors, but like. I, I don't see him like that anymore. Right. Totally. Um, totally. I think that I, back when I was, you know, a little guy, I thought that's what I was supposed to do was fight against all these big, bad plug and make. Well, we are when we're little guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's called uh, being a teenager. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> that's where rock and roll comes from. But, um, well, cool, man. So, uh, tell us about Bark of the Dog or Bark of Dog. Excuse me. Um, that was, I, I learned from, I don't even remember where I learned it from, but that I learned that just a a resonant high pass filter is a really handy tool to have. And the thing is, like, it's not like it's a um, it's a it's a feature that most EQ plugins have anyway, right? You can have resonance on your high pass filter, um, but it, it was sort of an eye opener to me in that while I had always had that tool, I never used it. Right? Yeah, I, I was always scared to use it. I was right. like, I don't want like, to take away the low end. Right. And and to add resonance, like when I look at the curve, it just, it looked like it was something that was wrong and I shouldn't do. Um, and it was, it was sort of, I learned that not only can you do it, but it's really good to do a lot of times. It was sort of like, okay, I have all these tools. We, everyone has all these millions of tools and there's so many things we're missing by not knowing how to really use them. Mm-hmm. And so I made Bark a Dog as like, listen, this is more of like a tutorial in the format of a plugin. You should be doing this, whether you use Bark of Dog or your normal EQ, you should be adding some resonance to your high pass filters because it makes a huge difference. Um, so one way for us to think about what it does is it's really, it's kind of the left half of a pull tech in a way, isn't it? Or um, no, or no. No, no. Okay. So Bark of Dog 2, which I released last year, uh, is more like that. Okay. I released an update that has two different... Uh, technically, it's like two different modes. It has you know the classic mode, which is it's a high-pass filter with resonance option. Um, and the second mode is actually like a Poltec with... It's as if you're twisting both knobs, the boost and the gain at the same time. Or the boost and the attenuation at the same time. Right, right. On a pull tech. And I put out a video once kind of showing exactly what's going on with the pull tech EQ. Because it was one of those questions that I had asked and I heard a million people ask. And 
I could never get a straight answer from anybody. Well, um, um yeah. So, so I, I remember that for me, that was also a learning thing was like the idea of rolling off low end on something and then also boosting or getting a boost at the resonant curve. But I guess, how do we describe it? Uh, through words. I mean, it's like you've got a curve. <laughs> right. Instead of the curve just going down where it's cutting off lows, it goes up a little bit before it goes down. It's like a bump, right? Right. And that's, yeah, that's the classic mode. And the, the, the Poltec mode is very different, though. It's sort of like the opposite. Okay. It, it's like it boosts the low frequency and it has a dip right there above, right above where it boosts. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm I'm looking at Bark of the Dog. Oh, I keep saying that. Sorry, Bark <laughs> of Dog, which is such a great title. That's why that's why it's, I love it. Um, but I'm looking at it on the website right now, and uh, it, it has a price of zero dollars. Is that accurate? Yes, it is a free plugin. It's a free plugin. That's awesome, yep. man. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, Rockstars, go check that one out. I'll, I'll have a link in the show notes for sure. Um, what what was your second plugin? How did you even decide to make a second plugin? Um, so I, when I first started, I was working on Sasquatch was like my first one that was like a paid plugin. Okay. Um, that was, that was, you know, the one that I thought, like, I haven't seen anybody do this. I think it should be made. And I made a little prototype. I'm like, I like this thing. Have I mentioned that I was very glad that you made that plugin? You have. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite um, secret weapons for kick. And, and oddly enough, when I had upgraded my pro tools rig, I think I forgot to install it for a minute. And here I was struggling with a mix. And then I realized I hadn't installed it and reinstalled it, put it on. And I was like, Oh, thank you. And it just <laughs> yes. completely saved the day. So tell us about Sas Sasquatch kick machine. Well, it started out as, I mean, you know, the, there's that trick where people put a gate. So they have like a, uh, a tone generator. Right. on a separate track and they trigger a gate off of the off of your kick drum to bring that tone up and down as your kick hits. And to me it seemed like that's really stupid to have to make an extra track and go through this complicated process to do that. Like why don't I just stick that in a plug-in and you can stick it right there in line with your kick drum. Right, so every time um, the kick drum hits, the tone tone generator creates a tone or a sound yeah. like a boom sound. Yep. Yeah, and you can set that frequency to whatever you want. So you can generate, you know, new low end that just wasn't there to begin with. You can make it super deep. Uh, you can tune it to whatever you want. Um, you, can just, you can make it sound like what you meant for the kick to sound like in the first place, or you can make it sound like a big 808 kick drum just going, do, right. doing trap beats, right? Yeah, a lot of times I just use it to, I, I just replace the, the original low end with the new cleaner, you know, more focused low end from Sasquatch and it sounds completely natural. Yeah. But sometimes you could just, you know, pew, pew, you know, add, you know, your 808 kicks and so you can do anything in between. Yeah. All right. Well, so, um, but there's also the beater. It sort of like helps you with your attack of your drum too. Yeah. Um, I added that because once I started playing with the low end stuff, I was like, wait, what about, you know, beater click? Can't we just do noise? Instead of, you know, triggering some low end stuff, we can trigger some noise, make it, you know, add to your beater click. Um, and when used, you know, and when used in moderation, it works great for getting your kick to really, you know, cut through. Uh, yeah, I find it super, super useful. So um, you have the ability to sort of dial in the tone in the low end. You can, you can dial in how long it sustains so you can make your kick drum go like doom doom or just doom doom you know mm -hmm. what whatever is right for your song and then the beater um just sounds sounds great it's just like this just right kind of attack and then um i know we i know we're going to be talking about new things that are just about to be appearing on the scene but um with sasquatch kick machine you can grab the the you know the the slider and move it around, and you can kind of find a tone or an attack that seems to also sit well in the mix, which is it's just cool. I mean, it's hard to make those decisions sometimes at the very beginning of tracking when you're uh, getting the when you're recording the kick, and it's hard to actually get that sound sometimes too. You know, right? 
But it's very cool to be able to dial that in later at the mix. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, because it's. I find that it's really hard to know what a kick drum is going to sound like until it's in the context of the song. Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, one of the things I like to ask guests on the show as we kick it off is to share an inspirational quote about hitting the studio. And I wonder if there's anything you wanted to share with us. <laughs> I, I'm sort of excited to find out what this might be. <laughs> <laughs> an inspirational quote. Jeez. Yeah. Like what, is there anybody that, that has inspired you in making music? Um, yeah, you know, I find, I mean, okay. So if I'm going to boil it down to a quote, I, 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 it's not a quote that I've heard from him, but it's more like a philosophy that I've, I've learned the more I go along, the more I really like it. It's just, don't be so scared of screwing up. Right. Right. I think, I think we live in a world where people hate, where the idea of failing or screwing up is very stigmatized, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Cause we see man. so much perfection now, which is yeah. not always perfect either. <laughs> right. We're surrounded by things that all look perfect and we all, screw up all the time and we try to hide our, hide the fact that we screw up all the time um but so, man yeah well so i was gonna say so that certainly applies to making music in the studio and to trying to get your mix right and everything but i think you know maybe a surprise is uh you know to hear from you that that applies to the creation of the same tools that we're using to mix oh yeah um i think it applies to everything really just you know to to really do something right you have to you have to try stuff that's new and you have to, to do new stuff. You have to do stuff wrong. You have to screw stuff up. Um, and I find that just owning your screw ups is far better than trying to pretend like they don't exist. Right. Totally. Well, I, I definitely try and own, I, I screw up a lot uh, hopefully I won't screw up on this episode, but I screw up a lot and I try to own them when I can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of your important philosophies for Boz Digital Labs, of course, is to try and create creative new solutions to our problems, um, which, which maybe it's safe to say that they're often mixing problems because we might be using them at the, pl uh, the, as plugins at the mixing stage, although they could be also just part of our production challenges. But do you have a way or a process in your own mind of how you identify something that seems like a, a useful problem and then how you t go about tackling the solution? Yeah, I, usually what I do is if I'm working on a song, I, I, I look at, you know, what I'm doing. Like, okay, so I'm going to add a compressor to my kick drum. Uh, and I look at all the different things I do to try to get something to sound the way I want it to sound. And I think like, why am I doing it that way? A lot of times, like the normal way to do things sucks. And we just do them because that's what everybody else is doing. Um, sometimes, sometimes everyone does stuff cause it's a good way to do it. Sometimes people do stuff a certain way because that's just what they do. Right. And it's what's become normal. It's trending. Uh, yeah. It's, and a lot of times those things just really suck and there are e easier ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so usually what I do is I find things that like I'm doing that are far more work than they need to be. Uh, and I see if I can, if I can, you know, bring that into a single plugin you know, sometimes a plug-in format is a really good way to fix the problem. Sometimes it's not. Um, but if I can bring into a, a plug-in and make make it easier to do something to get a good sound in the end, then then I make it. Okay. Well, I thought you know, I, I as I said, Sasquatch Kick Machine is a great plug-in. It's a really cool solution to the challenge of trying to get my kick to sit great in my mix. And um, are, are we allowed to let the cat out of the bag that there, yeah. there may be a yeah. future here for Sasquatch yes. Kick Machine? Tell us, tell us about that. Sasquatch 2 is finally coming out. I've been talking about this for years. I've wanted to redo it because um, well, it was one of my earlier plugins, and I've learned a lot about making plugins since I released that. Um, and once in a while, I found that I was using Sasquatch and not knowing what some of the knobs did. <laughs> I thought, wait, if I made this thing and I don't know what some of these knobs do, I'd just imagine everybody else trying to use this thing. Okay, dig it. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay. So I, I remade it. It In my mind, it's easy. It's more straightforward, although that's probably debatable. 
Um, but it, it should be easier to use, uh, easier to dial in the way you want it to sound. Um, and has a couple features that should make it sound better as well. Oh, super cool. Awesome. Um, are there, do, are we able to get into any of the, the features and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found that I really thought was lacking on the original Sasquatch was uh, having different waveforms. Uh, it was just a sine wave. Uh, but I found that a lot of times, like if you take, you know, a square wave or a sawtooth wave, and then you filter off the the upper harmonics, you can get sort of this deep kick that doesn't disappear on small speakers. Oh, cool, man. That's definitely a, a challenge for mixing. Because um, sometimes, right. you know, on the big speakers, you get all this low end power and then you go listen to it on something small. You're like, man, where'd the kick go? <laughs> and it, it's gone, right? Yeah. And so uh, a, a pure sine wave sort of has that effect where it's, it sounds huge on big speakers and completely disappears on small speakers. Yes. Yeah, um, so that's, um, I, I would almost describe that as, um, you know, one of the things you learn to do when you're mixing is that by adding upper harmonics to a sound, it begins to allow it to read more clearly on smaller speakers in a different situations. Right. And, and I, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a physicist about this stuff, but I believe when you go towards a square, square wave, you're getting much, 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 you're getting all the harmonics with a perfect square wave, right? It's like right, every harmonic. Of, right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You're getting all sorts of stuff up there and our brains sort of hear those harmonics and they, they can recreate the, you know, illusion that we're hearing the lower frequencies, even if it's not there. Right. Um, which is why low end distortion is so heavily used. Um, okay, cool. It, yeah. All right. So this allows us to sort of like um, dial in our kicks so that they're going to translate better in more places, yeah. which is pretty hip. Yep. All right, cool. Any other features that we should be excited about? Um, uh, this one is one that I was really excited about, but uh, I sort of took took some things I learned from making Transgressor and I made it so that it clicked it triggers off of the transient uh, of the kick drum so that you can have really short uh, click section, beater click okay. that you're adding. Um, even if you have like a big, mushy, original kick, uh, you can really just dial in like, add some really sharp ticks to it. Um, so it really helps bring out the attack of the drum. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it so you can do a lot more with the click. Now, let me, let me just ask you this. Uh, in context... Are there certain styles of music that might immediately benefit from a feature like that versus others? Or, I mean, just particular ones where I, you're like, would, would like speed metal be like, oh, thank God we have, we can get our, get in and I out quickly. So. Yeah. Cause right. Like, especially metal now, it's like, it's so dense. The guitars are, you know, are harsher sound. I'd, I guess the harsher is the word I'd use. There's a lot of distortion on the guitars and it's moving fast. So you get, kick drums that just get lost. Yeah. Um, so today you get, you know, kick drums are really clicky. That's sort of the signature metal sound now is really clicky kick drums. Uh, and this just lets you add exactly how much click you want. Well, that's cool. That's definitely awesome. Um, you don't have to worry about re-trigger times or any of that stuff that comes along with uh, uh, sample replacement. Right, where you have the sample triggering. Uh, you're trying to put a sample on a kick drum, but it's also triggering when the snare hits or the floor right. tom or something like that. Right. Okay, cool. Um, what else? Anything else um, that we should be looking excited oh, yes, to see? Yes, yes, It has MIDI capabilities now. The only okay. One not. <laughs> All right. Um, so how, how, how is that going to come into play in the studio? Like, what are some use cases for having it's MIDI? It's like you can just play the kick drum on your MIDI keyboard. So, um, th so this you could actually program a kick... Yeah. With just a MIDI keyboard and the plugin. Yep. Yeah, you can do that now. Um, and you can also tell it, 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 you can, there's a couple ways you can do. You can tell it to follow the note that you're playing. Uh, so like if you want to drop your kick from an E down to a C during the chorus, you can. Wow. Just by playing an E, then play a C. That's kind right. of important in a lot of pop production and stuff like that. Right. Um, and uh, then this makes automating really easy and makes it so you can just, it's really easy to make your kick follow along with the song. All right, cool. That's awesome. And so, so my brain's going here already. Um, if I was, if I had the 
Sasquatch triggering from the the actual kick drum in the song, but I was just trying to follow the key, the chord changes um, of the song. Can I have the MIDI tell it which note it's going to be resonating yes. a little bit? Without you can do it without triggering as well. You can say I don't want MIDI to trigger a note. I just want it to change the frequency. Oh, that's super cool, man. Yeah. Or you can have it trigger a note, and you can have it trigger a note and not change depending on the key you get. So you get you can set up however you want. Now I'll have to get a MIDI keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got one. I got a couple. I got a few. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, what else? Anything else we want to give a shout out to in the new version coming? Um, I just, you know, just more, it should be more user friendly, just better. Uh, uh, what's it called? Preset management. You can have separate presets for your oomph and your click and your mass or whatever, you know, just, just easier to use and easier to save settings. Okay, cool, cool. And um, I'm, I, I, my gut is telling me that I might be glad to have Sasquatch Kick Machine and Sasquatch Kick Machine 2 in my yeah, toolbox. <laughs> they are both different. Um, my plan is to sort of discontinue re- the release of the original Sasquatch, but it's, it'll be there for anyone who has it, you know, until it no longer works. Okay, cool. We'll get it. Get it quick, <laughs> rock stars. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode all right so now you mentioned um i mean i want to really talk about uh, uh, as many of your plugins as we can but you mentioned one just a moment ago you talked about transgressor tell us about transgressor okay so i transgressor for me it's a transient designer for people who don't like transient designers Cool. Um, I don't like transient designer plugins. Um, I, every time I use them, it's like if by the time you can hear what they're doing, it's too much. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I, I've certainly been excited about transient designer plugins, but then struggled sometimes with figuring out how and when to use them. Right. Um, so what I did is I, I sort of took a different approach instead of saying, you know, turn up the transient, turn down the transient which you can do, um, it, it, ra- it breaks it up into two basically separate channels, your transient channel and your sustain channel. And then it lets you EQ the two separately. Oh, that's pretty cool. So you can, um, you could make the um, attack of a snare drum bright and crisp, but the sustain of it could be right. much darker if you wanted to or something. Yep, exactly. So I can like take the ring out of the sustain on a snare that has a super ringy snare. Oh, because you can I put can like EQ a notch filter in. Yeah. Without actually changing the sound of the attack. Oh, that's cool. Um, I, so I immediately think that like you could get into some kind of sound designy stuff with it too, like start freaking things out. Oh yeah, you really can. Um, and I I find I love it, and it's sort of it, it's sort of a different approach, but I love it on kick drums. Okay, cool. What what are some ways that you like to use it on kick? Um, now we got three like, plugins to put on the kick. I know, I know, and it's stupid, but they all do different things. <laughs> um, but the transgressor on a kick, like you can you can boost the low end on just the attack, so you can get a lot of you know a big thumpy kick without like bleh, every right, time it hits. Right. Right. Um, or you can if you have a kick that's really has a lot of sustain. Uh, you can take that out. That was a good blah, by the way. Yeah, that was, right? It sounded just like a kick drum. We need to sample it and, <laughs> and write a song out of it. Um, okay, cool. That's that's super hip. Um, would you use the transgressor? Uh, we, we talked about snare. Would you use it on toms too? And um, yeah. are there, Have you tried it on some other instruments, like on un- non-drum stuff? I have, and it can, I've used it on like guitar to take out some like pick attack. Um, 
it's a little bit more finicky when you start to get to tonal instruments. Right, right, because drums are percussive. They're, they're sort of yeah. quick in and out. And tonal yeah. stuff has to uh, retain its perfect chord structure or whatever. Yeah, it gets it can get pretty messy if you don't set it up exactly right. Um, have you tried it on synths and stuff like that too? Yeah, I have, and I've tried on you know like piano and synths, um, but it really depends on the nature of the synth. Right. Um, well, I'm excited to check it out on some on the things it's not supposed to be. See, it's that that young teenager. <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> Um, what was the word you said? you know, like fighting, fighting right. the man? We're going to fight the man with our mixing techniques here. Go, go try to kill everything you can. Um, okay, cool. Um, now another plugin or an, another plugin, a couple of plugins that I know you've got. Um, but you mentioned, you know, the use of distortion and low end and stuff to introduce us to big clipper and little clipper. Cause I think those are super useful tools in the studio. Okay. So big clipper, well, little clipper Little Clipper is essentially a pretty straightforward clipper. Um, I, I hesitate to say there's anything super innovative about it, other than the fact that I tried to make it really easy to use and dial in. Um, but I, I just find that clipping is actually a super useful tool to have, uh, especially on drums. If, if you use it right, it can, it can make mixing way easier. Yeah, totally. So I think it's a combination of things, isn't it really? Like clipping in terms of a, a big transient getting chopped off can give us a sense of that's it's more powerful. I think it can also let yeah. us turn things up a little bit. But yeah, there's also so like, just fills like in the snare, body. Here. On a snare, like if you, because a snare, at least the attack portion of a snare uh, is, is is pretty close to just noise anyway, right? There's not a lot of tonal information in it, so you can you can get away with clipping it off quite a bit before it starts to have any negative side effects. Um, and by clipping off, you know the 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 attack of a snare, uh, you still retain a lot of the the attack, but but down the line, your compressors have a lot easier time working with them. Okay, interesting. All right, let's talk about the use case, like or like, like um, the workflow. So when you're talking about clipping the snare, are we talking about taking this plugin and just literally putting it on an insert on the snare track and, and yep. working with it there to start? Yeah, normally what I do is I stick it on the first thing on the snare track, and I bring it down until I can hear that it's clipping, and then I bring it up just a little bit. Okay, bring it down. Bring so, down the threshold. Yeah, let's let's describe what this plugin looks like. So we don't have the visuals, so we'll have to okay. use words. So, oh, words. Oh, bleh. Um, <laughs> That's why we got into music in the first place. Come on. <laughs> right. um, so it has, it basically it has an input gain and a, a ceiling or a threshold or whatever you want to call it. I call it push and pull because I was, right. wanted to do something creative. Words, you know. Um, but the ceiling, basically it tells it anything above that is just getting chopped off. Right. So, um, so we've got a, we got a rotary knob on the left called, called push and one on the yeah. right called pull. And if you bring the pull down, it's just like, it's, it's, you know, rock stars, when they talk about like, don't go into the red, you know, don't, you're going to run out of headroom. In this case, we're like intentionally running out of yes. headroom on our sound, right? That is killing the headroom. Yes. Awesome. Headroom killer. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should have uh, called it the Headhunter. Sorry, I, do, I digress. I, you know what? Sound Toys already did decapitate. I didn't want to. Oh yeah, there you go. Good point. Copy him. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, it clips off the top end. Uh, uh, you know the high levels, right? Uh, and distorts the, it. The peaks of the the, the sound, peaks. Right? There you go. Um, it clips those off. And so I'd like to turn down that threshold until I can hear it clipping. Because if you go too far, it starts to get gross. Unless, um, unless you're mixing one of my songs. No. Right. Go crazy. <laughs> no. All right. So you bring down the clipper. Now you also have like what we have shape on there. I can see. I'm going to. That's just between hard and soft. Okay. Um, honestly, I generally like to leave it on hard if I'm doing it on drums. Okay. Right. Because it's more, you, you want that. Sound yeah, of it, it grabbing keeps, it quickly. Keeps the attack more attacky. Now, there's also an attack and a release 
setting are the do those apply to the to these clipper settings as well that's that's on big clipper oh on big clipper okay sorry let me let me make sure yeah <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm getting I'm, ahead of myself here man yeah geez uh so i'm talking little clipper this is your basic clipping right okay, how, cool. how, how i started using clipping so i just stick it on a snare drum uh bring it down i clip it to the point where i can't really hear that it's clipping but i know it is uh and then from there it just makes compression easier to dial in it makes compressors sound more natural um it just makes everything downstream easier. Let's talk about some other things traditionally in recording. I know we're not trying to recreate the last 50 years, but traditionally there have been some other elements of a recording chain that would you know, cause things to, to be controlled with their levels and stuff like that. Uh, tape, analog tape, for example. Yep. It reminds me of that a little bit. Um, analog consoles, sometimes they just, the right kind of headroom uh, I guess sometimes in an analog console, you want lots of ad room. Sometimes you want, well, I think with most, you're trying to find that sweet spot. Oh, right. right. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is that with digital recording, like, I guess the name of the recording game has never been accurate reproduction. I mean, if you go into a room of a band playing live, nobody wants an album to sound like that. <laughs> right. Right. You want it to sound like, a well-recorded version of that band. Right, right. I mean, r drums on a recording don't sound like drums in a bedroom. Right, right. Um, Good point. And um, so oh, accurate go reproduction has never been the name of the game in recording, but digital gives us accurate reproduction. And so you have to know the tricks on how to destroy that accurate reproduction to actually get that good sound. Where it's yeah. sort of naturally done before for you already without you having to think about it. Well, you might have had to think about it. We'll give credit to the great engineers. You probably right. had to think about it a bit, but but there was like a safety net in some of the old analog gear that disappeared when we went to digital, and all of a sudden everything's just kind of pure sounding. Right. Um, which is not always a good thing. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's good. But a lot of times what, when you want it to sound like a familiar um, rock band in a studio – it needs to have those things that help control some of the peaks and stuff. So clip little clipper is great for that. Uh what about big clipper? What's the uh what do we move on to when we get into big clipper? So big clipper is basically what I wish all clippers did. Um it's actually a combination clipper and limiter. Um and you can blend the two in all sorts of different ways. Um, so it, it sends it down two channels. It gives you, it limits it. So, you know, you know what, how, what it sounds like when you send like a drum through a limiter, you smash it hard. It's not distorted, at least not very distorted. Um, but it also kind of kills off the transients. Right. Um, and then a clipper is distorted, but it sort of keeps that attack. So this sort of could, big clipper combines the two and you can set them up as you know, with a crossover. So it's, limiting the low frequencies but distorting the high frequencies or the other way around yeah that that feature is super cool and super eye-opening um i saw you demonstrate that i think in a video and then i went to go try it too where i was taking um a bass guitar and and really pushing the push input and then also pulling back on the limiter and again, I kind of don't exactly know what I'm doing, but I mess with them a little bit until I start to get a cool sound. Right. And then you get this, like, you can get it to where the bass is sounding super fuzzed out, but you're like, yeah, but that's not exactly what I want. I, I need it to be, have big, tough low end. And you go into the frequency sensitivity, and then yeah. you can back off the lows, which I guess is, I'm not, you'll have to explain what that's doing to us if we need to know. But But the effect is, all of a sudden, the low end of the the bass that's distorting is clear, like the like the low end's coming through, but it's just the upper mids and highs that are distorting and giving you right. all that that readable quality in your mix. Uh huh. Yeah, essentially, what it's doing is it's making the distortion algorithm not. It's uh, it's it's making it so it's distorting the low end less. Right. I, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and so it makes it so you can drive something really hard and still kind of keep the natural sound of it. it. The the result is that it seems to sound clearer. Right. 
Um, now, I remember learning this years and years ago, a uh, friend, Obad Khan in St. Louis, I, I have his, one of his mic trees here, but he's an amazing guitarist, and he also designs a lot of, lot, tons of great guitar amps to, to this day. Um, but I remember him telling me way back then that the secret to a great guitar distortion and what made his sound great with the amp that he had was that it didn't, it distorted the highs, but not the lows. Yeah. You know, and yeah, then, it, and when you distort the lows, you end up with that more mushy, just like, like everything's uh -huh. like a, like a pedal sound as opposed to right. a good tube overdrive. Yeah, exactly. And I found once, cause I was messing with, you know, different distortion algorithms and trying stuff. And I found that the frequency sensitivity made a huge difference and you can, you can dial in any distortion sound you want from that. Right. So if you want something super over the top that distorts the crap out of everything, you can definitely get it with this plugin, right? What are right. some, what are some places um, that you think it is, let's see, how do I ask this? What are the reasonable uses of this? And then what are some of the totally unreasonable uses of this that you've tried that, you, that we'll be excited to hear? Um, honestly, I put it on every channel. I distort to some degree everything unless it, there's a good reason not to. It's almost like having a little bit of a, a, a analog console right. on that channel, except that each one you can dial in to find the sweet spot for that sound. Right. Yeah. And I have a I have a few presets that I jump to most of the time, like on vocals. I'll just pull up one of the vocal presets, and I'll probably just stick with that. Um, and on drums, I'll probably stick with one of the drum presets. Um, okay. Now, yeah, does I, does it also include a parallel? It, can it be used in parallel? Is it like do the mix, mix knob? knob. Kind of thing? Yeah, there is. A oh, mix that's knob. that's super cool. Yeah. Um, so you can. Quick question about that. Um, is there are there uh, considerations about latency and phase that you know you put into building this that makes it good, uh, very effective for parallel versus? I, I know that like for example with the Sansamp plugin, which I've used in the past, it's really cool for what it can do, but it will also it kind of messes with some of the phase when I try and use it in parallel, and I don't think I realized that until until just recently. Yeah, I, I always pay attention to that when I'm making a plugin that, especially if it's intended to be used in parallel. Um, and actually, the way that big clip, the frequency sensitivity works, I had to go through a few different ways of doing it to get to one that didn't screw up the uh, phase relationship between the wet and the dry. Oh, cool. Well, it's awesome to know that I can just like stop worrying about it. Just start using it <laughs> yeah, and stop should, worrying about screwing up. You should be able to next. use it. Um, very cool. Well, places that I know it can be also really useful is, um, you know, if I wanted to have my drums, but also bus it over to, you know, this very distorted one. I, I was watching Andrew Sheps talk about, you know, a mixing template that he used recently where he was sending stuff over to kind of a a trashy sound and he could like sneak that into the drums and it sounded super cool. So I'm really excited to use Big Clipper in that context. And I know that, you know, repeatedly for a long time, I I've always been trying to add the right kind of distortion into the bass in my mix to make sure it reads really well and vocals too. And those mm -hmm. are tricky ones to do because sometimes you go and you try things and you're like, that's pretty cool, but it's not quite it. And it's cool yeah. that you you made a tool that's going to allow us to sculpt that pretty well, you know? Yeah. Um, what do we do with the attack and release settings on Big Clipper now that now that I'm looking at the right plugin? Okay, so th <laughs> those are the attack and release settings for the limiter portion. So you can, um, I, I I almost feel like I gave too much of a uh, raw control over the distortion sound to where you really have to know what it's doing to make sense of it. Do we have um, to make sense of it? Can't we just use it to. until we like the way it sounds? Yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> and in fact, when I use it, I usually pull up a preset and then make minor changes from there. Okay, dig it. Um, well, that, that's helpful. Yeah, even I, I mean, now that I've let it sit for a year, I go back and think, yeah, I'm I'm going to pull up a preset because I made a bunch of presets that I liked. Uh, and, and they sort of run the gamut, gamut of what can be done with it. Because uh, you can you can dial it in. It gives you enough control that you can dial it in to make it sound super crappy. 
Right. If you if you, you mean you know, you're saying I can, you're saying I'm capable of making the wrong mix move? Oh, you can you can definitely make the wrong mix move with Big Clipper. Oh, that's all right. Um, well, I think you gave us permission to do that in the beginning of the podcast with <laughs> yes. your inspirational quote anyway. That is true. Uh, let's jump forward and talk about another really super cool plugin that you created called Manic Compressor. Certainly, we need compressors in our world. Yes, and we do. Um, is this the only one we need? Well, it's the only one I use, but I'm sort of biased. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Tell us what um, it does. It's got a it's got a lot of uh, features in it that are pretty cool. Yeah. So it started out with like because I had a bunch of compressors and I had a bunch that I really liked. Um, but I really, really like the sound of parallel compression. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found that a mix knob on a compressor is sort of like, it's sort of like doing half the job. It's not quite doing what a parallel compressor should do. I always felt like it was faking me out. Like I always like get a thing and then I'm trying to pull the mix knob back and I'm like, is that, I can't tell if that's doing it. Did my yeah. level of my whole drum set just change? You know. Well, yeah, and and it's it's sort of like a co- I, to me it's sort of like a cop out to call it parallel compression, but it's not. It's missing some key elements. Um, so I, I one of the things I did I just broke it out into you know separate wet and dry faders, which you know is technically is pretty similar to having a mix knob, but it's to me at least for me personally it makes more sense. Uh, to break them, break them up separately, but it also lets you EQ, you know, the wet or the dry sound. Oh, cool! So, isn't that one of the um, clickable, uh, yeah. like deeper settings to do that? Yep. So, if you click on the, you know, the tone control, you can EQ the compressed sound. So you can, you know, sculpt out the mids and just compress it really hard, and then blend it in to taste. Well, that's super cool. So, Rox, I'm going to try and explain this a little bit. If if, for example, you're used to taking all your drum tracks and then sending them all down to a couple of augs returns below that, and you know I've done this many times where one of them is just like drum bus and then one's called drum slam, and the slam does all compressed, and then I and then I like sneak that fader into the mix to try and find my my finished thing. Imagine uh, sometimes that's a pain in the butt. Sometimes you're like, well, how am I gonna? Do I send them all to one thing? Use two augs with the same input? That kind of thing. You can do that now. You could just send it to one drum bus, put this on the drum bus, and now you can have the the dry fader up within the plugin. And um, actually, you could start by turning the dry fader down and just soloing the compressed one. Get a cra- crazy compressed sound that sounds cool to you, but you never use it by itself. Now bring the dry fader up and sneak in that second compressed fader and manic compressor, and all in one bus and in one plugin, you've got. Um, a great way of doing that that's definitely phase coherent. Right. Yeah, and to me, it was it was sort of a... I love parallel compression, but it, it just... I was limited to how many tracks I can do it on before my whole project was just impossible to look at and understand what I'm doing. Right. So by sticking it in the plug-in format, you know, you can stick it as an insert and you can have parallel compression on every track. All right, so we've got a bunch of knobs on here that are cool too. So input drive, I'm guessing is just it's like an input level into this whole thing, right? It is input level, but it also adds distortion. Well, cool. <laughs> now, now when the drive is on zero, there is no distortion at all. Um, but if you a- turn that drive up, it's actually different than turning the input up before the plugin. Okay, so it just adds some more. It adds, ac- it ad- yeah. It adds action. Yes, action. All right, and then we've got um, traditional stuff like attack, release, threshold, ratio. Yep, all the um, stuff. We don't have to get deep into it, but do you want to quickly explain what ratio is to the rock stars? Yeah, ratio is essentially how hard it's going to be compressing after your signal goes above the threshold. So you know, once your sig- once your sound is higher than the level you tell it the threshold is, it's going to start turning it down. Um, and the right. ratio basically tells you how much it's going to turn it down. Right. So it starts out the knob. If it's all the way to the left, it says one uh, colon one, which means one to one. An input of one is going to give you an output of one, which means it's not doing any compressing. Right. And then all the way to the right, it says 100 to one, which is insanity. 
Right. Um, and it means that like absolutely no matter how much you push into this, you're just getting out one level. That's yeah. it. Forget about it. Right. <laughs> But well, how come you didn't just add, put forget about it on there? I guess it's hard to <laughs> Maybe make Maybe I should fit. have. Th that's one of my biggest regrets in life. Is not I putting didn't. forget about it yes. on there? Yep. All right. <laughs> well, I appreciate you indulging that. <laughs> so then we've got mode. We've got clean, sheer, gritty, digital, vintage, smooth. They all sound cool, but where do we, where do we begin to try and know which one to try out? You know, I, I put them there as a whole bunch of buttons because... I wanted to be able to set it up and then just click through them quickly to find out which one I like best. Okay. Um, and that, that was another problem I had with compressors. You know, I had a lot that I liked, but A, being them was hard. Right. Uh, I yeah. Had, you have to bypass one. I, like, I on set them up the one. same and then I turn them on and off and it's just hard to know which one I liked better. Um, give us a brief tour of what all these six different modes are and... Um, what what might we hear as we flip through them? Um, so uh, clean clean is sort of just like your it's sort of like your textbook uh, compressor algorithm. Um, it's it's pretty transparent, you know, in moderation. Um, it doesn't have a lot of character to it. It's uh, a, like a pure clean compression. Yeah. You get the compressed sound, but you're not messing with your. Your sound going through. Yeah, I mean, if you go, if you go and download, you know, a stock plug, a stock compressor plugin, it's probably a very similar algorithm to that. Right. Exactly. Um, Except stock plugins don't let us uh, blend our parallel compression quite so easily. Right. <laughs> you right. And so I, I found that I actually like that sound pretty often. I don't always want a lot of character in my compressor, so yeah. I use clean when I just want to compress without making it known that I'm being, that I'm compressing. Right. Dig it. Um, sheer is, it's sort of a laggy, it takes a second for it to kick in. Um, is that, if I'm going to be completely if, honest, it's my least favorite mode on. <laughs> okay. Is it, uh, if I think of a LA 2A, is that kind of a laggy grab? No. I feel like sometimes ah. it, I can't tell, but I, I feel like the attack comes through more than I, expected. Yeah. And I'm not going to compare it to, to something like that because I didn't actually model it off of that. And so to say it sounds like an LA-2A would be uh, pretty... Be stupid. Uh, it would be, be stupid, stupid to say. Yeah. It Forget about it. <laughs> um, but in, in light, in small doses, you can... Um, if I'm going to use sheer, it means I'm not compressing very hard. Okay. There's definitely times where we want to like a, mild, a gentle compression on there. Right. As opposed to something that's super, um, you know, really transforming the sound. Right. Um, how about um, gritty? Gritty is it. It's, it has more of a a what's the word? It has a harder attack, but it is a little bit laggy. Probably more like what you're describing with the the uh, LA two A. Okay. Um, it takes a second for it to recognize that it's above the threshold, but then it clamps down pretty quick. So it's good for it's it's pretty good for drums. Okay, I dig it. All right. Um, what about bass? Is that like uh, which? Well, we can keep going through them, but it'd be cool to think of these as like which ones we might start with on drums, bass, guitars, vocal. Okay, so if I'm doing drums, I'm using either gritty or vintage usually. Okay, cool. I like the sound of both of those. Well, uh, how about bass? Do you have a go-to for bass? I probably stick with vintage most of the time. Vintage right. or clean. Um, vocals. Uh, Does it really what? depend on the song? I, I'm, I'm going to say I'll probably go with vintage or smooth. Okay. Um, how about uh, electric guitars, big rock guitars? I would probably stick with clean or vintage. Am clean I just or, clean am, and vintage are my two favorites. Are you just saying vintage to me because I have this beard, this white beard that no, I look like Fred no, Van vintage, Michael? Vintage, and I, I <laughs> <laughs> it was a stupid name, but I couldn't think of anything else. But I think it's but, good. I think we probably all vintage get it. Vintage is probably my favorite one. All right, dig it. Um, do you want to tell us about digital and yeah, smooth? I guess digital is kind of a funky compressor in that. Um, and digital is not a good description of it other than the fact that 
in a normal compressor, you would never have an algorithm that sounds like this. But in parallel, it can sound really cool. Okay. In other words, is it one of these things that can maybe only be designed in the digital world as well? Well, yeah, it could, it would, no one would ever release a compressor that sounded like the digital compressor unless it was, you know, in the format of, of Manic Compressor, where you have the, it's designed specifically to be used in parallel. Have you found some particular use cases that, that really got you excited? Yeah, it's really good for like adding attack to drums. Yeah, cool. Um, All right. Because what it does is essentially it, um, so if you have, like a drum that hits your compressor, normally because it's short, it's not going to turn down as much if you have a slower attack, right? Right. You have a slow attack, it's not going to, it's so short that it's not going to turn down quite so much. It's not going to compress as hard. Um, but digital compresses hard no matter how transient or how short the signal is. So it's almost like having a, an, an infinitesim infinitesimally small and quick attack time. Except it lets the the attack through it's so, like having a it's like a com, it's compressing as hard as a zero attack compressor but it's letting the attack through it's a magic trick it is and it sounds really dumb by itself but in parallel it's really cool okay awesome man well this, these are all exciting things to want to check out um and then smooth i mean does it sound smooth it sounds smooth it has a smoother release shape so where are some places you mentioned vocals on that are there yeah. um i like it on vocals i use it on drums as well when i don't want it to be um like when i'm not going to do heavy compression i'll use it on drums when i just want to add a little bit of compression in parallel or something i'll okay. use smooth mode all right dig it um then we, uh, we're going to get to this. There's one knob in particular that's going to get us all real excited here in a minute. But yes. first, let's go over to beef. Where, where's the beef? beef? Yeah, what that's doing, it's, it's adjusting the, uh, the shape of the sidechain filter. Um, ah, so dig it. All right. When it's on thin, it's, uh, it's given a bit of a, a low-end boost to the sidechain. So that it's compressing harder the... The, uh, oh, I see. So thin would be how you describe what's going into it, maybe. Yeah, it's it's it should sound thinner. It sounds sometimes. thinner. It, okay, it, all right. It should sound thinner. Um, maybe, maybe you just flip should, through all three and see which one sounds yeah, best to you, right? It, and it's sort of like because you have control over you have you know a three band EQ for the side chain, um, but that switch is sort of just like a quick, just a okay. quick version of that. All right, dig it. Um, and then I know up at the top we have, we also have MS or stereo. Yeah. So we can operate this either way, right? And then you have, a, you have, um, there's another circular knob up there. Is that a mix knob as well? Sort of beyond the, Let the. Let see. I'm going to pull it up right here. Yeah. I'm just looking at the image right now. I don't have Pro Tools open, but I'm looking at the image from the website. Um, let me keep asking questions about it then. Yep. While you're doing that, tell us about this exciting knob called Loud Relief. Okay, loud relief is my favorite part of the plugin. Actually, I didn't know it was going to be, but it is. Um, so, essentially, what it does is it makes it so that the harder you're driving the compressor, the less hard it will compress. Um, and a lot of you know analog. That's so a lot of like the really nice analog the old analog compressors, what happens is you see people, they say, look, I can apply 20 dB of gain reduction. It still sounds good. Well, this is why. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I think on the surface, it sounds like you're saying we're going to compress it and then we turn this knob up and it's just undoing that, but it's not that, right? It's, it's, it's not quite. It's not, so... It's like it's, it's letting punch through. Yeah, so like, so... When I use this plugin, I honestly, I put ratio at 101, 99% of the time. Wow. And I, I use loud, loud relief instead of turning down the ratio. Because it just, it's like a ratio, but sounds way better. Okay, that's super cool. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, I, um, I don't know that I would have, uh, well, I might have stumbled on that. But if I was thinking about it too hard, 
I might not have gone to there. And it's just I a know. reminder to us all to stop thinking, start grabbing your knobs and go all the way. Well, yeah, it is. In fact, it does. if if I were to redo this, I would remove the ratio knob and just have loud relief be the ratio knob just because it sounds so much better. Oh, that's cool, man. All right, dig it. Um, now, I know that we've also got um, the tone controls down below in the window, you can see like the, the sound coming through. You can see what the compression compression looks like. So graphically, it's kind of a cool layout. And it's just kind of pretty common for your plugins that you give us this cool way of looking at what's going on too. Um, and then there's also an auto makeup button, which is hip, right? Yeah. And that basically Rockstars means that as you're compressing things, auto makeup will bring the game back up for you. But I think I was surprised to discover, like, don't assume you want auto makeup on or off. Try it and just go with whichever yeah. one sounds better to you. Yeah, I don't always use it. All right, dig it. Um, let's take a break and we'll come back in for the jam session and keep talking about more of your awesome plugins. Rockstar's a reminder that we'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes. I've built a YouTube playlist for you so you can go check out. Um, Boz has got a whole collection of videos where he's explaining how these work and also just uh, um, being a funny dude too. Some of the some of the videos are just hilarious. <laughs> um, and then I've got one in there too, where I started mixing some of my music just using this this great toolkit from Boz Digital Labs. And we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. If you want to design and build a great house, then you're going to need great tools. You could build it with an old hammer and some nails, but it's a whole lot easier to use an air compressor and a nail gun. Well, the same thing goes for mixing. If you really want to create a pro sounding mix, then it makes a lot of sense to start with a great toolbox of awesome plugins. This is where Boz Digital Labs comes in to help you get killer mixes easily, quickly, and creatively. Provocative will make your vocals sound lush and wide. Transgressor and Manic Compressor can help your drums leap out of the speakers. Gate Weighty and Big Beautiful Door offer unique new ways to tighten up your tracks, while the wall will make sure your mixes are in your face and competitive. And my favorite is Sasquatch Kick Machine, which can transform your kick drum from sounding like a home studio cardboard box into the perfect punchy kick without using samples or triggers. To download your unlimited trial of any plugin now or get one of Boz's free plugins, go to BozDigitalLabs.com and put the best in your mixing toolbox. Click the link below in the show notes to learn more. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting color and distortions. Make sure to check out the Black Hole series BH1S and BH2 with the awesome looking hole in the middle of the mic, combining innovative industrial design with meticulous electrical engineering to help your studio sound incredibly expensive for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, if you use the coupon ROCKSTAR, you will get an astonishing 50% off. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the BH1S. So what are you waiting for, rock stars? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. 
Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Boz Millar, joining us from uh, Olympia, Washington, and uh, the founder and creator of Boz Digital Labs plugins. So we're going to jump in and talk more about some of these great plugins that he's got, how they can help you get great mixes in your studio, and uh, just have a good time. Boz, you ready to jam? I am ready. All right, dude, sweet. So one of the first plugins that I got that I really loved um, and have just actually recently started re-exploring again is Imperial Delay. It's <laughs> it's so cool, man. So first of all, let me describe what it looks like. You've got like the face with a whole bunch of interesting knobs on it. Um, and then you have off to the right, like there's this like a grayed out image of a, ta a reel of tape going too. And it just reminds you that this thing's got some great tone to it. <laughs> Tell us about Imperial Delay and um, what, first of all, what drove you to want to make a delay plugin in the first place? Um, okay, so I had a couple of delays that I really liked. And I found that the delay plugins that I liked the most did more than just delay. Um, the, you could really kind of dial in a lot of different sounds with it. Um, Cause yeah, to me, to me, delay, delay itself like is interesting, but delay combined with distortion and reverb and chorus yeah. and heavy EQ is, is when delay gets interesting. Well, this is a super, super versatile delay plugin. Um, and it's one of the things that I really dig about it. You, you, it's capable of so much stuff, man. I mean, it's not just, it's like you've got your delay and you got your feedback and stuff, but it's got all these other features built into it that you don't, you don't always get in a delay. Right. And yeah. And that's what I've found. Like, I was like, okay. So the hardest part about making a plugin is figuring out like what to take out, what right. to not include. But in something like this, like I wanted everything in here, <laughs> but I didn't want 10,000 knobs on the screen making it impossible to use. Because I think we've all used, you know, either hardware or plugins that have so many controls, you just don't even know what, where to start. Yeah, there was some, some of the classic rack mount gear, digital stuff, particularly like right. that, that experience of being in the studio and wanting to do something. And then next thing you know, you're just, you're, you know, uh, crisscross on the on the floor of the control room, flipping through menus until you forgot what you were trying to do in the <laughs> right. first place. Right. So I really wanted to avoid that. Um, so what I did is I took all my all the effects that I really wanted in a delay, and I gave them just a single knob. So there's drive, which is you know distortion. You know there's feedback, which is standard. Uh, it has a duck option. Has you know different modulation. You know what? Let's let's not go through too quick. I, I'd like to okay, break some sorry. of these down no. if you want. But um, we've got the big knob for tempo. Then you have uh, you know some of the stuff you'd expect, like a tap tempo, which is, actually that's really handy. And not I wish more plugins did have that in there. Mm -hmm. Like you should be able to just tap the screen and not have to think too hard, not have to go look for the right tempo of the song. What if you didn't cut to a click? All that stuff. Right. Uh, but then you also have you know you can just adjust it yourself. Um, there's a, there's a LCR thing, a mode stereo. What's that all about? And then offset. Okay. So LCR, you can, so there's only one knob here for delay. Uh, when it's in C, which is, you know, center, it's actually, this knob controls both your left and your right delay. Okay. But if you go into L, you can adjust the left delay channel to whatever you want, go to R and make it something different. Oh, okay, cool. That's a super simple concept and an easy way to do that too. Yeah. But it's a lot easier to have one knob. Like for example, the times where I pull up a plugin and it's in kind of a dual mono setting and I'm I'm having to grab one knob and then grab the other to match right. them. It's really frustrating. It's nice to have the one knob when you need it. Right. Um, and then offset, what about that? Offset. So that applies a slightly more a slightly higher delay value to the right channel. Um, so it kind of widens the stereo image a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So instead of, you know, you can have the same setting on your left and right and then just offset the right a little bit. So you can adjust because there's a lot of those, you know, stereo, you have separate control over your left and right and you can set it up that way. But then if you want it to be, okay, I want the whole delay to be a little bit longer, 
you have to go redo it all. Right. Yeah. And I hate that. Yeah. So this, you could use the big knob to change your delay time, but still retain the stereo offset. Yeah. So, and Rockstar's the stereo, the offset just means if you, if you hear something on the left first and then, and then on the right, um, it, it sounds wider. It can also make it, s- uh, we're getting into deeper into stuff, but you can also make it sound like it's coming from the left, which is another right. plugin we're going to talk about in just a minute here <laughs> called Later. Um, but let's jump to the next thing. So then you have a drive knob and a little button that says E on it. What happens if you turn that knob on and then and then go into E as well? Yeah, so by default, the drive is off. It's not doing anything. But the second you move it, um, it adds some distortion to the wet to the distorted signal okay cool the, to the wet the delayed sound and um, reasons why that can be useful are you know there's a reason why when i break out my old echoplex tape delay and it sounds all funky and crusty why everybody loves that versus right. a super sterile digital one it's because it has drive and compression and stuff going into it which you've built into this right um, and so inside the drive, um, hold on a second. I, this is the E button we're about to talk about? Yeah. So if you click the E button, it actually opens up more, uh, options for the drive. Uh, so you get character, which is essentially, it's adjusting the, uh, like the, uh, like harmonics, the tone, tonality odds, it, right? odd and even harmonics. Okay. Um, has a tone knob and has a blend knob, so you can blend your distorted with your clean. Awesome. Um, and it has different modes of distortion. So if you want to sound like a megaphone, you put megaphone mode and then adjust the character or the tone to match what you want. That's awesome. This is a super powerful plugin. Um, and then feedback is what we would expect. It's like how many repeats of a delay we want. Right. And then it's got um, some, you know, some expert settings or whatever there. Yeah, uh, there's some actually weird settings with the feedback, but if you know how to use it, it's super cool. Do you want to talk about those? I can't click on it right now, so I'm, I'm leaving okay. it to you to click so, on it. So for one, it, you notice the feedback gets into the red. Once it gets to the red yeah. zone, it's above 100% feedback. Um, but there's a limiter built in, so you can you can drive the feedback really hard, and it's not going to so blow badass. up your headphones. That is super badass. That wow. also means... So that doesn't mean... Rock stars, that doesn't mean, oh, he's protecting you from accidentally doing something dumb. It means you can do something dumb, make a creative statement, and it's going to be okay and sit in your mix. Because right. when you're doing runaway delays, um, when I do it on a console, I have to set up a limiter on that channel so that in case it goes crazy, it doesn't destroy my mix. Especially when I mix at Bonnaroo, for example, I'm mixing in real time, and I can't go back and undo my crazy delay that I did. So having that kind of stuff built in like that is really awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I found I found you can do all sorts of fun stuff when you go into crazy feedback mode. Um, but yeah, you can it also has, you know, you can select change the polarity of each channel if you want to do some funky stuff with the feedback. Cool. Um it has a dynamic delay. Is that the docking knob below or no? No, it's different. So when the level the input level goes above the threshold, you can change the feedback value. Oh, cool. Oh, so, so, you like can, you, so on loud notes, it can take off, but the rest of it is all chill yeah. and under yeah. control? So you can say, I want it to go crazy when I get loud and do crazy feedback, and when it drops, it just decays like normal. Dude, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so you can, yeah, it's, it's actually really fun to mess with. Um, very cool. All right. Now the next knob down, uh, I don't mean to let me know if I'm skipping over anything, nope. but, but we've got the duck now. What duck. people are like, why do I need a duck in my mix? Is this going <laughs> to quack or something like quack, that? Quack. Yes. That's what it is. It adds quacking sounds. Um, now what the ducking does is it turns down the delayed sound while the dry sound is going. Right. Cause what, ha- if you're doing a lot of feedback or something like your mix can get pretty nasty and stuff gets pretty unintelligible pretty quick if you have too much delay going on um so ducking sort of turns it down while there's sound going on and then it you know turns it back up once it goes away so you can get you know the last word of your sentence 
gets more delay to it. Yeah, it it's, a, it's a really cool feature. Um, I think the first time I was introduced to that was in my Green Line 6 pedal or whatever that had something like that for guitar. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. And I actually did a video with Ken Sluter where, where he was showing us how to do that with a plug-in. Um, but it, you know, and it, this this one, it's what's so cool about it is, is it's just right there. Like you just right. like add some more ducking, no problem. It's ready to go. It's it's and it's really super useful where you can go crazy. You can have a very, very treated and wet sound, but when the singing is happening, it's not wet, so it's not screwing with the clarity of what the lyrics are. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very cool. All right, so then we get into the next area, and this gets really interesting. You've got modulation, which is probably like, can we think about that like the classic modulation where it's like it just kind of speeds up and slows down the delay? Yep, yep. it's and, exactly that. And the first time we play with that, you put something in, it goes like... <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, that's awesome. Yep. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, any other can, settings around that? To sort of like, it's sort of, it's sort of like the offset, right? Um, how you can make it sound like it's wider or coming from one side or the other, um, but you can modulate that. So it sounds like the delay is bouncing around from left to right. Oh, so it's modulate. So instead of one delay going faster and slower, it's doing that on the, on the right and opposite on the left or something like that? It's doing it, yeah, slightly different on the left and right. Oh, that's super fun. Um, and then smear. What's smear? Smear, it's it's a reverb that's inside the feedback loop. So, okay, so here's a little something. Uh, all these controls here in this middle section, this dark blue strip, are happening inside the feedback loop. So every ah. time it feeds back, it's going through this again. Okay. All right. Interesting. All right. Dig it. Um, um, and, so and smear is kind of like, I, I always thought of that as the thing that makes analog uh, tape delays decay. Right. Right. So it's like in a real real or in a real echo, right? It bounces off the wall and it comes back, you know, sort of, I'm sorry, hit my microphone, sort of smeared in right. time. Um, and every time it bounces off the wall, it gets more smeared until it ends up just like a, psh, like a reverb sound. Right. So the smear is basically every time it's going through, it's hitting a, a reverb algorithm. Every time it goes through the feedback, it's getting a bit more and more reverb to it. Okay. Dig it. So it's a good way to just kind of, um, st I don't know, stretch out and smooth out the, the delay yeah. sounds too, you know? Um, now color. Color, it's, it's an EQ. It's actually a tilt EQ. I guess I can't say tilt. It's a slant EQ. Okay. Tilt is trademarked. I oh, guess. is it really? Oh, man. Yes. I got in trouble with T-Bone the first time I made it and released it, and they said, you can't use the word tilt. Uh, it's like, ah. What about the tilt-a-whirl <laughs> at, the, at the carnival? Are they, they're getting in trouble, too. Oh, they're busted. They're busted. <laughs> I've, I've turned them in so many times. Um, all right. So, but it allows you essentially it, you know, if you turn it one way, you're just getting more highs and less lows at the same time yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And so the color is, is basically a blend. The, the main color knob is essentially a blend. So you're telling how much EQ to apply. Okay. All right. Dig it. Um, and then I, there, I know there's expert settings on all of these. Instead of me yeah. asking you about every one, just jump in if there's an expert setting you yeah. want to, you want to show Those settings are pretty standard. Uh, just it's, it, for me, it's a great way to add each each delay gets slightly more EQ'd. Okay, all right, cool. Oh, so you get like that. Yep. Oh, that's super cool, yeah. dude. That's straight up dub right there. Um, and then we get into pitch left and pitch right. Pitch. This was just, I thought it was fun, so I stuck it in there. Um, every time it goes through the feedback loop, it applies a pitch shift. So it, it that, doesn't that give it that kind of widening sound effect yeah too. so you can yeah you can apply a slightly different pitch to the left and the right um and if you do really small amounts you get you know that micro pitch shift sound mm -hmm. um which is great for vocal doubles like getting better wider vocals um and if you really want to have fun with it you can do sort of extreme and so it's like hello hello, hello. right it'll keep it, pitching shifting yeah. with every delay okay awesome super fun um, and then we go into the next section. You got your classic dry and wet. Um, instead of a blend knob, again, you've given us individual faders for it. So yeah. knobs, which is nice because sometimes it's just 
easier to dial that in than. And especially with delay, it, it's, it seems to make more sense than a than a mix knob. And then we get yet another width knob. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this width knob, so all these effects here in this strip are happening after the feedback loop. Right. Um, so this just adds extra width to the output if you want to add that. Um, right, because sometimes you've got it dialed in, and if you went back to try and do it at the, the first one, you're like, ah, no, it's changing my sound. Right. You or know, you can bring the width it. down. So if you do some crazy stuff and it's just too wide, you can bring it back in. Okay, cool. And then we also have chorus. Chorus. I added a chorus because I like chorus on my reverb or on my delays. But I'm just saying, telling you, dude, this is like one plugin. It's like Christmas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of work. Well, it's worth <laughs> it, man. It's a super, super useful one. And, and Rockstars, I would suggest that with this one, you could do slapback. You could do your longer delays. You could do a widening effect. You can do chorusing. You know, you can, you can do so many cool things with this. So it's a great place to start. Um, awesome, man. Anything else you want to give a shout out to an Imperial or should we just keep moving on? Yeah, I guess we can just move on. All right, hold on. I'm, I'm, uh, pulling up whatever's next. What do you want to talk about next? We've got so many things. Probably don't have enough time for everything. Um, I don't, should we mention, give a shout out to later, which is just a really cool, simple plugin. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be, especially since we just talked about, uh, the offset knob. I, I took the offset knob and I made a plugin out of it. Okay, cool. And it looks um, like crayon on a piece of paper tacked to, uh, you know, the wall. The, <laughs> actually, it kind of looks like it's tacked to the kitchen floor at the moment, but. <laughs> it was, I had more fun making those graphics than I've had, than I did on any other plugin. <laughs> it's a, it's my favorite plugin design I've ever seen. <laughs> Only a few people have gotten really angry about it. Well, I don't talk to them. Um, who do you, uh, or sorry, how do you want to describe what it does? It's, it's just, I mean, this, this isn't like anything super new, right? It's a micro delay between your left and right channels. Um, the easiest way to describe it is that like the way our ears hear sounds, um, if something's coming from the left, it's hitting your left ear first and then your right ear. And that's how we know where sounds are coming from. Right. It has very little to do with actual volume difference like a real pan knob does. Um, so when sound hits our left ear first, we know it's coming from the left. Sound hits our right ear first, we know it's coming from the light. So this applies that sort of delay so that you can pan stuff without actually changing the level, which is handy to have sometimes, although you can run into mono compatibility issues, so it has a mono check button. Right. Because what you're doing is you're... Um, so you put this plug in on a mono track, and then you take the big... Uh, it looks like a um, uh, um, twister or something like that. You spin this big knob over to the left, and it and it it is basically delaying the right side a little bit, so that it sounds like it's coming from the left, but you haven't changed the the level or the volume. Right. But be, but when you do that, um, and I I remember learning that about that and experimenting with building a whole mix where I was just doing these time delays between two different <laughs> things. And it's really fun, man. You can really is. create like a unusual and cool way of, of getting sounds and mixing. And it probably translates to headphones in an interesting way too. Yeah. Right? In fact, in headphones, it's a much more natural sounding way to pan because it's, it's how we hear things in the real world. Right. Um, well, might as well go over to, uh, where does that take us to mongoose? Yeah. Uh, because Mongoose. is it Mongoose? Yeah, Mongoose includes an additional feature that creates what you would describe as a as a much more natural panning result within headphones, right? Yeah. So so Mongoose and Pan Knob are very similar to each other. There's two separate plugins that are sort of the same idea. Um, so Mongoose basically takes everything below a, uh, a cutoff frequency and sums it down to mono. Uh, and the reason for this, there's a few reasons for this. One, again, the way we hear things in the real world, low frequencies we hear in both ears. And because our ears aren't that far apart, there's very little phase difference between the two. So we can't right. really detect where it's coming from. Um, so low sounds, low frequencies are coming from the middle anyway. Um, and especially on headphones, 
if you have like low frequencies coming from one ear, it almost hurts. It, it's almost headache inducing. Interesting. Um, I don't. I don't like headaches. I I don't anymore. <laughs> um. All right. So so let me see if I can understand this too. So if we if we've got something panned, um, by using this crossover f- uh, frequency and having the low, uh, decreasing the width. It's like we're still hearing the mids and the highs panned over to one side, but the low sounds like it's coming into both ears. Right, yep. And it's almost like um, if you got headphones on and you listen to this, without it, it, you get that, what you described as like that freaky sound of like one instrument just coming in one ear like a like right. a bug in your ear. But when you put this on it, it makes it sound more like you've got a pair of speakers in front of you and it's panned to the left. So, so it's a little bit more of a natural right. um, version of that. And again. All these things we're talking about, rock stars, they're all they're all to taste, and they're they're right. descriptors for like if you do this, it sounds like this, and if you do that, it sounds like that. It doesn't mean you're not going to choose whichever way you want to do something in your mix, the way that you just feel like choosing at the time. But it's great right, to exactly. have all these tools, you know, yeah, so you can try this stuff. Yeah, um, and cool, cool. Mongoose is one of my favorite plugins. It's really simple, but I it I use it ninety percent of the time on every mix. How do you like to use it? I usually just stick it on my master bus. Um, and if, if there's something that is going to be that I want a more extreme setting, I can just stick it on that one track um, or one bus if I need more extreme settings. But for the most part, I stick it on my master bus and I put the settings pretty low. Um, and on loudspeakers, you shouldn't really hear a difference. But but essentially what but it's on doing, you should. okay, cool. Yeah, there's definitely times where I'm doing mixes and I listen on headphones later and I'm like, I didn't want to change the decisions I made in the mix, but man, right. this sounds screwy in my headphones, you know? Yep. To me, it's like an instant translation tool. It All translates right. better to headphones. All right, let's, let's re-describe what it's going to do on the master bus. So by setting the crossover frequency, do you have any f- particular frequency you tend to go for? Um, so on the master bus, I'm probably going to do around 150 to 200 hertz. Okay. And so Rockstars, that means that everything below 150 or 200, um, do you take your width and go all the way to mono or do you just kind of bring it in a little tighter? You can, you can tell it how, how narrow to go. Right. Um, but usually I'll just, if I'm going to be that low, I'll just bring it all the way down to mono. Okay. Dig it. And that's just going to take anything that's low frequency that's and make sure it's coming out of both speakers or both headphones. And everything that's above that frequency is going to have the full discrepancy of left and right. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Awesome, man. All right, let's keep going. So another thing we haven't talked about yet, which is is funny for me to bring up because I introduced this as not wanting to recreate the past 50 years, but (laughs) you couldn't help yourself. And you do have a wonderful signature series of plugins that you did with um, uh, David Bendeth. Is that right? Uh Uh-huh. Um, tell us about those. Okay, so he he wanted me to make a plug-in version of his uh, his hardware compressor. It was a Compex vocal stressor, um, and I I was a little bit hesitant to do it at first because it's not like my favorite thing to do. Like like you know you read like I don't I don't love the idea of recreating stuff that's already been made. Right. Um, but when I got it and I sent drums and was like, ah, oh, crap. I do like the way this thing sounds. <laughs> and I was a little bit annoyed that I liked it so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so, so yeah, it's, so tell us what it is. What is the original that we were recreating and, and, um, what, what can we expect to get if we use this as a, in our mix? Um, I, I use it on drums all the time. Um, I just love the way it sounds on kick and I, I just love the way it sounds on drums. The way the way it attacks is, I, it just sounds cool. And this is the um, com. It's a it's a compressor and an EQ, right? But so we yeah, have the, so, the plus ten so the dB and then also the hoser. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> hoser is an thing. EQ. It's a Ward Beck EQ. Um, okay, I dig it. Which Ward Beck Rockstars? If you don't know, Ward Beck was. Uh, you seem, you know, sort of like on the street, commonly described as the Canadian Neve. <laughs> yeah, 
for whatever and that's fact, worth. I don't know if that's worth anything. After after we released the hoser, because they're yeah, they're Canadian, right? Um, they emailed me. I was like, oh crap. <laughs> um, but they're like, we love this thing. Can we put our name? I was like, oh yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> so, awesome. You know, so they uh, they endorsed it. That's they were great. happy with it. That's great, man. That's great. Well, like you said, we got to um, uh, be able to make mistakes, right? Yeah. Um, better to uh, ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> <laughs> Something okay. like that. Not, not, a, not always, but... Um, Especially with the IRS. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Here we are at that time of year. I know. That's all um, I think about because I haven't done it yet. Oh, boy. So, so the plus 10 dB EQ um, and compressor and then also the hoser... The plus dB is uh, plus ten dB is the Compex. Is that what it is for both the EQ yeah. and the compressor? And that's yeah. not Ward Beck. No, it's not. Okay, different different thing. All right, cool. But what were some things that you had to learn how to do, or you know, if you wanted to give us a brief insight into what it means to model a great Ooh. piece of analog gear without getting too over our heads, what would you say it is, about it? I I mean, so I looked at the schematic, I ran tests, and I ran more tests. And it was eventually it got. I mean, for the compressor, the compressors are hard. In fact, I've I've tried doing other compressors and I've worked on them for months and just said I like I'm I'm not getting it. I'm calling it a day. Okay. Um. This one, you know, I went back and forth, and finally, once once I couldn't tell the difference in a blind test. And I sent it off to David, and he thought it sounded like the hardware. And I was like, "Okay, we're good to go." <laughs> cool, man. Jeez, but that's it was, good it's to know. That, work. That's good to know, and it's good to know that that kind of um, precision and care went into making it. Uh, because I know that you know sometimes people have these conversations about you know is it sound as good as the real thing and everything, and it's like, well, here's a here's a couple that really do. Yeah, and and it's. I mean, there are, I mean, anytime you have something like this, like there may be extreme settings where it's like, oh, that does sound different. I can hear the difference. Um, but I, I got, I try, I ran through so many corner cases trying to make sure it all sounded the same. Good Ooh, deal. It was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in Presona Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. All right, cool. Well, let's see. What else do we want to talk about? I mean, we've got, um, we talked about Mongoose. One of the ones that was intriguing to me, well, there's two actually. There's provocative and panther stereo manipulation. Let's, let's talk about provocative for a moment. Yeah, provocative was actually, it came that's another one that came out of uh, uh, Imperial Delay because it had I had some presets in Imperial Delay that do a sort of a micro pitch where it takes you know whatever's coming in it pitches does a pitch shift just a few cents sends it to the left does another pitch shift sends it to the right mm -hmm. uh, and it gives uh, it's sort of a I don't want to call it a doubling effect because I feel like that's dishonest. Because it doesn't sound like a double take. It I, th sounds I think like, about it as a widening effect. Yeah, I think of it as a widening effect too. Um, people call it a doubler, but I, I, I think when they're doing that, they're being a little bit too uh, loose with their language. 
Um, I, I call it a, a widening effect. As a responsible parent, you've learned not to be loose with your language. Yeah, spot. exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. So why unresponsible to call it a doubler? Um, why, why does it make it sound wide? Is there any anything we well, should understand about that? Well, yeah, because anytime you have something different coming from the left speaker than you do coming from the right, our brains will hear it coming as wide. And so when you give it a different pitch shift from the left to the right, it almost sounds like it's two different voices, right, coming from different sides. Um, you don't get the timing differences you get from a double take, but it makes it sound like there are two voices singing the exact same thing at the exact same time right. coming from two different directions. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a sound that I use to some degree all the time on vocals, almost on every vocal track. Sometimes I do it low enough to where you can't tell it's doing it, but you can tell when you turn it off. And sometimes I do it pretty extremely. Now we've got some stuff on here. We've got a width knob, a pitch knob, a delay knob. You want to take us, and then also like a looks like frequency, um, low shelf and or no low cut and high cut. Oh yeah, um, let me pull it up so I rem so yeah. So these these were pretty. And again, this isn't a this is something that's been done by other plugins as well. So the idea itself wasn't brand new, um, but I wanted to make it basically more straightforward to use. Um, your width basically tells you how wide it's going to pan. So if it's going to take one and pitch shift it and pan it to the left, by default, it's going all the way to the left and coming out the left speaker only. Right, right. And the other one's coming out the right speaker only. You can bring that in if it's too much. So 100% width means like all the way left, all the way right. And and br turning the width knob down is just like panning your two left and right panning faders the two, in yep. towards the middle. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, delay tells you how much time delay, because it, it adds a little bit of a delay, a modulated delay between the two to give a little bit more separation. Um, and it, it lets you determine how much delay to add. Right. So the uh, the left side is is maybe tuning down a little bit, and the right side of, is pitch shift, micro pitch shift up a little bit. But then the delay is there's also a delay between the left and the right so that it makes it feel a little wider. Yeah. In the way that you explained that the human ear hears whatever's first on right. either side. Okay, cool. Um, and pitch tells you how much of a pitch shift is being done. So if it's at 20 cents, it means it's turning the left one down by 20 cents and the right one up by 20 cents. Okay, cool. So what would you, um, how would you verbally describe some settings in terms of like, styles of effect you know like what's a subtle if we're doing a pop song and we just want the voice to sound you know uh airy and wider is there sort of a starting way to think about that at all yeah i i like to do the i like to do the pitch almost pretty extreme um anything from 10 to 20 um i find works pretty well and the lower in volume the the pitch shifted the wet sound is the more you can get away with doing heavy pitch shifting. Right, right. Um, and I find I found that it's really helpful, insanely helpful to add some filters on the pitch shifted sound. Um, and is that what the sliders are that I see yeah, on the plugin? Yeah, so it's a high pass and a low pass filter, which makes a huge difference in how how good it sounds and how natural it sounds. Um, so can you can you filter it so where it's just like the pitch shift is just all highs and then all of a yep. sudden it just sort of widens the air up top? So yeah. Yeah, so you can put a high pass filter on that so that you just get all the high end from the pitch shifted. And then you can blend it into taste, you know, how how loud you want the wet sound to be. Okay, cool. Um you know, when I was talking to Ken Sluter, we were talking about adding stereo wideners to bass tracks sometimes and having that uh -huh. as being a useful thing. And, you know, I jokingly talked about going back to the eighties, but I think it's a, a point well taken. I've heard, um, Jakir King talk about doing that in the past too. Um, and I'm sure, you know, many, many, many people have done that, but is that one of the uses for this? I know it's yeah. uh, thought of as a vocal thing maybe, but, uh, you know, maybe yeah, it's on for bass it works bass. great. And you can, and you can, you know, high pass filter the pitch shifted bass so that it's not adding all that junk to the low end. It's just, you know, 
it's giving the base a stereo effect, but it's not making your low end bounce all over the place. Right. And in the same reason we just used um, mongoose to make sure right. our lows stays in place. We're not, we're not making it swim in the bottom. Well, that's cool. Awesome, man. Um, let me uh, go to the next one and uh, let, let us know if there's anything else about that one that I forgot to ask. But, yeah, um, that was pretty straightforward. That should be most of it. Okay, so then uh, here we go. Space, uh, Panther stereo manipulation. Okay, that was also one of my first ones. Um, that is, it's essentially, it's an eek. Uh, you know what, let me pull it up. It's, I, I use it all the time. It's got, a, it's got more knobs on it. It does. Um, it is one that I use all the, if I have a stereo track, this is going on it. Um, okay. What, what is a way for us to think about what it is? So, I mean, stereo manipulation, uh, obviously we assume it's manipulating our stereo image of whatever our sound is, but how does it do that? Yeah. So it has an EQ. It has a different EQ for the left and the right. Okay. Um, so you can EQ your left channel separately from your right channel. Um, you can adjust the timing. So like if you stereo mic an acoustic guitar, and one mic is farther away, you can just quickly fix the delay so they line up. Okay, cool. That's interesting. Um, um, and then it also has an MS, a mid-side mode versus a left and right treatment. Yeah, I thought so that was I, kind of clever that you could manipulate that. Yeah, so like if you want to, instead of you know EQing your left and your right separately, you can EQ your mid and your side separately. And also adjust like the delay on your side channel. Um, so in a video that's in the playlist I put together, you kind of demonstrate that on a stereo acoustic guitar, and it makes it almost sound like by delaying the, the side, so you put it in mid-side mode, and then by delaying the side, um, it makes it almost sound like roomier if you want it to. Yeah. Just yeah, pretty it's, hip. It's a really, I, I you know, stumbled upon that after making this. I was like, oh, you, you can do some cool stuff with this. By delaying the, giving a small delay to the side channel. Now, could you take this, like if you had a mono drum track overhead, could you sort of fabricate a stereo drum yeah. overhead with this? Yeah, you could. And, you you know, you do want to be careful with how you do it. Um, because, you know, whenever you're going from, whenever you're fabricating stereo, you have to, you have to be careful not to screw things up. You mean as far as like mono capability? Yeah. Um, okay, dig it. And then you got some pl uh, some uh, some presets for that one too. So if we if our first glance is we're not sure what to turn, just start with the presets and flip through. Yeah, and actually there are not a lot of presets on this one. And again, this was one of my earlier ones. So it was um, th this one. I'm gonna make a, a new version of it at some point. And it's it's more. It was hard to do presets for this one because it's it's very much designed for fixing specific issues in specific tracks so if right. you you know have two mics on a guitar and one of them has too much low end you just turn down the low end on that track yeah yeah um, right that's actually super track. helpful you know I, yeah. I didn't even think about that but a, a use case for that plugin um potentially really good use case for it is if i'm double micing guitar amps or, or bass amps or anything like that and I and one of them has got is too boomy, and I want the other one, but I want them to live on a stereo track. I can right. adjust the belt, the level balance between the two of them. I could recompensate for the delay if there's a you know if there's any phase issues between mm -hmm. the two, and I can EQ them at the same time. Yeah, exactly. And I know, I mean, for me personally, I like having stereo things on stereo tracks. I, I might be in the minority on that, but I really like it. All right. Um, um, well, that's cool, man. Let me, I, I know we're, we're starting to run long on time and I, I want to ask you a few more things. So let me jump forward and ask you about um, uh, a couple that we haven't brought up yet. So um, the wall, which we didn't mention, which is uh, a gr very useful, uh, it's got a hilarious video on YouTube too, <laughs> which I just reshared on Facebook today. <laughs> Not everybody thinks it's funny. Well, all right, all right. Maybe we won't we won't talk about it. You watch <laughs> it later on your own time. But the um, you know, a lot of times we do need to make stuff louder, and we need to make sure that our mix is is hot enough to send to the client. Hopefully, not overcooking it. 
but uh, just finding that sweet spot or we're in the mastering stage. What, what should we expect to find with the wall? Yeah, my hope was in making it that I could have a single limiter that can sound good on any style of music. Um, Because I find, I mean, there are a million different algorithms for a limiter. Mm -hmm. Um, And some songs sound really good with one and sound good, terrible with another. And I've... I wanted to make a limiter that was really easy to sound good on any song. Yeah, can you can so so speaking from those of us mixing, we just want the right one. Can you just give us the right one? <laughs> right. And so there's only two modes: there's smooth and aggressive. Um, smooth. The smooth mode uh, is for less percussive stuff. Um, I guess stuff that you where distortion is not as acceptable. Okay. Um, Do you, does, does any kind of music come to mind for you when you think about that? Yeah. So if I'm doing like a piano, a song on piano or something like that, I, I use smooth all the time. Um, a lot of acoustic stuff I'll use smooth. Um, and a lot of stuff actually like hip hop with a lot of low end, I'll also use smooth. Okay. Interesting. Um, cool. So you've got the two settings and then what else do you do? Uh, you should be able to just set the threshold, pick your setting, and then adjust the flavor knob. The flavor knob just adjusts how much distortion is really going to be allowed. Now, this wasn't another hip hop reference. It wasn't supposed to be called the flavor flavor knob. Ah, it was. <laughs> it didn't make it past the committee though. All the right, committee sucks. Now we also have things like I got to be honest, man. We have things that make my brain hurt sometimes, where I'm like. Dither. Oh, I don't. What am I supposed to do with dither and oversample? You don't need to do anything with dither. So what do we do when we first see that? We just let, we're just like, thank God Boz picked the right settings for us. We don't need to touch those knobs. I don't ever touch those. Um, I leave dither off because my DAW is going to do it anyway. Right. Um, I leave oversample off because honestly, I think it sounds better without. I think oversampling is sort of a gimmick that most of the time does more damage than good. Okay, cool. So it's there if you want it. If you want to do some more damage. Yeah. Some, now, what about within a mix? Might we mess around with the wall like as part of our drum sub mix or any yeah. instruments or anything like that? Yeah, it's pretty common to put a limiter on a on a mix. Although I generally tend to use clipping instead, clipping and compression. Um, right. I know a lot of people use, uh, you know, a brick wall limiter like this on on their sub buses. Well, fortunately, you have um, provided us with some pretty good clipping options too. Right. Um, so here's another one that is uh, new and unique. Um, well, I don't know if it's new, but it's unique. Gatey Weighty. Tell us ah, about that. Weighty. Why do we care about a gate plugin? Uh, that is a good question because there are so many of them, you just need more gates. <laughs> um, no, I, I made Gatey Weighty because. I thought the way that gates work is kind of stupid. Um, it's like somebody invented a gate 50 years ago and nobody has changed it since. Nice. Um, cause like if I'm, you know, trying to get it, kill symbol bleed or something, I don't want to turn down the sustain of my snare just to kill the symbol bleed. Um, I was just talking to a student about that. Andrew, you know, you know, I'm talking to you, but we were, uh, we were trying to set the gate and, and I was, you know, showing them that you don't have to go, it doesn't have to be open or utterly closed. You sometimes right. you just want to, you know, guide the stuff you don't want out of the way in a way that sits right in the mix. Right. Yeah. It doesn't need to be so extreme. Um, a lot of times just turning down 60 B or something on the symbols is enough to get the bleed under control. Mm -hmm. um, and so Gatey Wadey sort of lets you uh, be very selective about how hard you're going to be cutting stuff out. So, you know, it has standard controls. It has a range. So you can say, I only want to turn it down by, you know, 6 dB. Right, right. And then you've got your attack and you've got your release. Let's, let's clarify this just since I got an expert on here. Attack and release in a compressor means the compre when the attack is set, it, will, it won't start compressing right away. Um, and with the release too, with a gate, um, 
Attack means it will open up. If the attack is short, it'll open up very quickly. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. And then, um, and then look ahead. What's what? What do we do with something like look ahead? Look ahead is for something like so. On like if you have a kick drum or something, where the beginning of the waveform takes a while to actually hit the threshold, and you have your attack on really low, it can it can kind of like pop open, right? And you don't really want that. So look ahead makes it so like if I look ahead just a few milliseconds, it'll open up and let's sound through before it hits the threshold. So that by the time your kick drum's coming through, it's already open. Okay, so look ahead isn't like the plugin's actually looking at the waveform earlier. It's just taking that point at which it would open up by the attack setting and making it happen sooner. Is that well, a way to yeah, think about it? Yeah, does, but it does have to look ahead to do it, right? Okay, all right. Um, but it compensates for it, so... So it's, it's, it, the times we would use it is if we feel like we're having trouble hearing the, the the initial detail in a sound as the gate opens up. We increase look ahead, and now we're going to hear more of that initial detail happening. Yeah, or even like in not even detail, but if like you have a voiceover track, uh, and you don't want it to like cut in, like right. you want the whole word there, but you don't want it to cut in and sound like someone's turning on and off your microphone. You can bring the attack up slower and then bring the look up ahead and then it'll Oh right. So it's so it's it. almost like you put a nice gentle crossfade going yeah. in, but it makes sure that that fade happens before it doesn't cut off the beginning of your word. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, that's super hip. All right. So let me let me describe where I just used Gady Wady and I was like, rescue. So we had I was doing a dub record on my brothers, grass coming out soon, y'all. And um it, it, the bass on it, I think, uh had it had buzz on it in between the bass notes, especially once I sort of amped it up and got it really cooking, um, which it needed. But then it was like, oh, I need to gate out the bass in between the notes to try and get rid of the buzz because it was enough openness in the mix that you could hear it there. Um, and But a, a regular gate was just going to make the bass sound choppy or it was going to cut off the attack of the bass notes. And what Gatey Waity does that's so cool is it has a crossover frequency in it so that it's not just gating the entire sound, unless you want it to, it will, right? But it can gate out just the low end so that it's, um, I forgot which setting I did. So if you have sort of what looks like a, um, a low pass filter and then you have a full band and then you have what looks like a high pass filter and the first button means that it's when, it, when the gate opens up, you're going to get all frequencies and when it gates, it's cutting out the the highs or the lows. I don't know if we can really explain it verbally over the, but just know that you can cut out, instead of gating everything, you can just gate the low frequencies, which is what I did with the bass because it cut out the 60 hertz hum in the bass. Right. And it made it sound really natural and got rid of the buzz, which was awesome. Yeah. All right, that's enough talking, Lidge. T tell us how the, <laughs> the opposite end of that could be useful on a snare for getting the hi-hat out of there in simples. Yeah, so like I, I generally use it in, I guess I call it low frequency mode, where anything below the threshold or below the uh, cutoff frequency is not going to get gated at all. Um, so like on a snare, if I want to keep the body of the snare there while cutting out the, uh, the cymbals, it, this, when the snare hits, it'll open up, the gate opens up, it lets the whole snare through. Mm-hmm. But then when it drops below the threshold, it'll turn down the high frequencies. So the body of the snare will still ring out, but the uh, the symbols will be uh, filtered out. Right, because it's a darker sound. Right. Um, and the, the amount of filter, um, what is there a knob that lets you set how much filtering it's going to do for that? Yeah, is, that's, is there, that's what the, the range, range will do. Yeah, okay, the cool. range. Oh, yeah, I, I want to turn that. it down by 3 dB. I'm going to turn the high end down by 3 dB when the gate's closed. So it's okay, going to cool. be really subtle about it. So that could be useful. Um, also, the the toms, right? Like, what if you do yeah. like some of the natural ring of the toms, but you don't want so much sub ringing through on the floor tom? You right. Could, you could have it only open up when the floor tom hits, but then, then sort of filter out the lows. So yep. honestly, I mean, I haven't done this yet, but I, already I'm thinking – you could actually use more than one gatey weighty on a track. You could have one that's dedicated to a, just a, a normal snare gate, but then on top of that, at a, at a 
a higher threshold, you're just sort of filtering out some of the highs there. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, same thing with Tom. So very cool, man. Um, all right. So let's let's go to our closing questions here. Uh, you have, uh, for the rock stars, some great free plugins. And I thought I'd give you a chance to just make sure that they know about that so that they can go um, start checking out your stuff. And, and get this, rock stars. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but any of these plugins that you want to check out, the demo is unlimited, right? Yeah. Yeah, the demo version, basically, the the limitation is that when you open your project, it'll reset the settings. Okay, so that's cool. I mean, that's that's totally reasonable. But it means that um, you can play around with it and know exactly what it's going to sound like and, um, you know, maybe print it real quick before you right. close your project. But You're I mean, supposed to say that. I know, but I mean, the <laughs> truth is, obviously, I know right. that, you know, as I use a plugin and I love it, I'm just getting it. So that's that's exactly. that's the end result. But um. Tell us about the, the free ones that people can go check out right away and, and what they're used for. Um, yeah, Bark of Dog is now Bark of Dog 2, uh, which we talked about already. Um, it's basically, it's my favorite tricks for low-end boosting right. or cleaning up. Which is cool because when you're mixing, one of, the, one of the simplest useful tools that can really help your mix out is just learning how to cut, up, cut the lows out of things that need it to be cut out and also yeah. get that little that little extra bit of boost around the the kick and bass to tighten it up. Mm -hmm. um, and Penipulator is another one. It's it's sort of just like a quick uh, mix checker button for checking in mono, uh, checking that all your polarity and phase stuff is all okay. Um, and and it's just a super handy, super simple. Just a few switches that you can switch on and off to just do a quick test. Again, I usually leave that one on my master bus so I can just quick do tests as I'm, yep. as I'm mixing. It's super cool because um, not everybody's got a mono button easily, either within the DAW or even on their volume knob controller. And this gives you a one button thing. It's a lot faster than, you know, panning your left and right into the right. center and then having to repan it back out again, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, so that that's supposed to be really quick quick way to just test stuff. Um, let me also point out, you you added a cool feature where you kind of created, a, the switch on there is its own pan law, right? So you can flip to mono, but it's not going to make your whole mix 3 dB louder out of the stereo output where it's going to kind of start clipping. Right. Yeah. So by default, it's going to add them and then subtract, you know, 6 dB. So that it should be the same level. Um, there are times where you want to add it without doing that. So the option is there. Um, oh, that's a good reminder. Default. I think I just said, I accidentally said 3 dB on the last interview I did with Ken. Sluter, oh. So I was wrong. It's 6 dB. <laughs> that's so embarrassing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> or you can switch to your left only or right only. Oh, that's cool. So you can hear exactly what's going on on each yeah. channel. Um, yep. Very cool. Can you do left only and mono? Yes. So when you put on left only and switch the mono on, it'll take the left channel and stick it in the middle. Oh, I see. So it's not like you're going to only hear out of one speaker at a time. Right. And in fact, I have a newer version that I haven't released yet because I have to update the graphics that lets you say, I want it to send to the left or the right or center. Okay. I'm going to make a suggestion live here on Recording Studio Rock. Okay. Um, one of the tricks that I like to do sometimes is I'll go into mono mode and I'll turn off my right speaker so that I just turn and look at my left speaker and only mix the song out yes. of that. And that's a lot of fun. So if that would be really cool to have that right in the one plugin too. That's why I'm putting it in because I like to do the same thing. Now, that's not why. The reason why is because you rock, <laughs> man. That's right. Why. Oh, yes. That. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, Boz, what else do we need to talk about? Anything else? I mean, let's remind the rock stars that uh, to be on the lookout for Sasquatch Kick Machine 2. Yeah, it's coming out soon. Hopefully yeah. in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it's probably out as this podcast episode goes live. Oh, so yeah. Very exciting. Um, check that out. And um, again, I encourage you to go check out all of Boz Digital Labs because in order to build and create a great mix, you really need a great toolbox of plugins to work with. And um, these are some of the most creative and unusual and, and very useful ones that are going to help you do a lot of stuff um, you know, you got everything from sculpting your tone with EQ plugins to compression and dynamic um, control to 
spatial stuff that will allow you to create um, delays. Can you with with something like um, Imperial Delay? We didn't talk about it, but I can't remember if there are sort of reverb features within it as well. If you want them, well, this the smear knob is a reverb algorithm, right? That hits every time it goes through the feedback loop. So it, you know, you can use it as a reverb as well. Okay, cool. So you can get a lot of mileage out of that, which is yeah. really awesome. Um, and then, of course, check out, start out with uh, Panipulator right now and Bark of the Dog for sure, so that you can start checking your mixes in mono and you can get your low end under control. Um, Boz, how should the rock stars find you online? Where should they go to learn more about you and, uh, and check out your world? Uh, my website is bozdigitallabs.com. Um, once in a while I post on Facebook, although I'm pretty hit and miss about that. That's just because you're busy making our next cool uh, plug. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, the website's a good place to go and I, and you can sign up for the email list and I send out emails every time there's a sale or something going. I try not to spam people too much. Um, dig it, man. Well, it's really awesome hanging out with you on the podcast. Um, I'm going to see if I can get you to come hang out with us some more. Um, Sweet. and maybe we can do a YouTube or something like that. So we can really dig into some of these and, uh, and do Q and a with people, but, uh, thank you for joining us, dude. It's a pleasure hanging with you. I'm excited to get back to mixing. And actually I, j I just learned a ton about your plugins by doing this episode with you. So oh, I'm good. excited to put those new features to the test. Sweet. Um, and then Rockstar, as a reminder, we've got links to what we're talking about in the show notes. Uh, of course, there'll be a link to Boz Digital Labs right there as well. And there's a YouTube playlist where Boz is showing off all the different ways to use these plugins. I've got some mixing in there as well. Um, and there should be more coming. And thanks for listening, man. Thanks for being here with us, Boz. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right, man. We'll talk, we'll talk soon. All right. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.